Welcome to this conversation with Elizabeth Remy Johnson, principal harpist of the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra for more than 20 years. Ms. Remy Johnson is acclaimed by critics and audiences for her complete mastery of the harp and its secrets. In addition to her orchestral works, Ms. Remy Johnson has an active career as a soloist and chamber musician, performing across North America and throughout the world. She is a graduate of Harvard University. Now here is William Ford from AtlantaMusicCritic.com in conversation with Elizabeth Remy Johnson. Can you talk about when you first got an inkling that music might be a good career for you? Well, it was a really slow progression for me. At first, you know, I was really little when I started. I was six years old, so it was just something that I loved and loved doing. And then it was really when I started getting into youth orchestras in high school and started spending more time on the weekends with that group of kids and the conductors we had um, that it started to become more and more a part of my life. But I still wasn't convinced I wanted to do it professionally. That, that shift didn't happen really until the end of high school. When you started to play, did you say at six? Yes. What did you play? So I started on a really tiny little harp um, that was really just wood and probably 10 or 15 strings. And uh, it was just what my parents could rent at the beginning to see if I was would want to continue with it. And so we just rented a progression of larger harps. Those are called troubadours or lover harps. They don't have the pedals on the bottom. So they're a little bit more limited in terms of the keys you can play in. But then eventually they started um, renting pedal harps for me. And then when I was in high school, I got my very own pedal harp. Were your parents musically inclined? They are not professional musicians. And my dad likes to say that he gave me all of his musical talent unused. He, um, he also says the nuns tried to teach him, but he just didn't get it. But his father was by profession a dentist, but had a band on the side and they would, he played piano in the band and they would play all over the Boston area. And then in my mom's family, she grew up, she played clarinet in school and I think middle school and, and played piano, took piano lessons, but it was, wasn't something that anyone on that side of the family pursued professionally either. Do they have something akin to the Suzuki method for the harp? They do now. They didn't when I was little or it wasn't in place when I was little and studying as a young kid. So I actually already knew how to me read music. Uh, we had a piano in the house and my mom, I can still see it. She wrote on a little strip of cardboard, which the names of the notes were. Uh, and we had some old piano books of hers. So I would tool around on the piano as a pretty young child. So when I started Harp at Six, I already knew how to read music. I knew how to work both hands. So it was, um, it was a pretty easy transition. When you were in high school, did your peers take any notice of you playing the harp? I didn't play much at all in my high school. The orchestra director there, when I joined the high school, said that he'd never seen a harp part in his 30 years of conducting and wasn't about to start now. So that was less than ideal, but I did sing in the choir and in my public high school and that was really fun because I did all of the like all state festivals with the choir groups and we just had a blast so it, it worked out fine um, but I would go to Boston on the weekends to be in the Greater Boston Youth Symphony Orchestra and the Youth Philharmonic Orchestra at New England Conservatory so that was really where I could kind of expand my soul with the kids that liked the same things that I did and we would just have a blast on the weekends. But in high school, during the week, I think probably many of my fellow students didn't, didn't even know I played an instrument because it just wasn't part of my in-school high school experience. It was kind of a long drive for you to Boston, wasn't it? It is. Um, it's an hour and a half each way. So Fortunately, we could usually put my lesson on one of the two weekend days, but when we couldn't, then I would end up having to go up three times a week, and that was a little harder. 
that got to be um, a little more difficult. But when I was in younger high school, my mom would drive and I would do my homework in the front seat. And then when I was old enough to drive myself, we had a beat up old Volvo station wagon. So I would get on the road 6 a.m. Uh, on a Saturday morning. And I really, really loved my Saturdays. I would start off with chamber choir and then youth choir and then have history and theory, a little piano, just to, to have that familiarity. But I, um, my piano teacher was not a fan of my playing I, because I wasn't as, um, I didn't practice piano as much, let's just say. So I was never really a talented individual at all in piano, but I knew my way around the keyboard. And then I would have the last three hours would be youth orchestra. So it was a really full day, but we had a great time. Was there at any point that you said to yourself, is this really worth it? Oh, no, <laughs> no, no. I, I lived for the weekends. That, that was what I loved to do. It was really fun and really exhilarating. And I even loved the drive because you have to remember the time period was I graduated high school in 91. So there was none of this constant availability with a phone in the car. We had a big old phone just in case I had an emergency because I was still, you know, 17 year old on the road for an hour and a half. But I loved being alone in the car. I put on a Broadway musical and sing my way to Boston. It was great. I loved it. And then you went to college? Yes. I went to Harvard, so stayed right in the Boston area, and I majored in music and French at Harvard. I started off as a music major because Harvard was the one place my parents would let me go and be a music major. Anywhere else, they would have insisted on a double major from the start. What was their thinking on that? Oh, job security. Because you have to remember, they weren't they aren't professional musicians. It was a completely unknown field to them. And they thought the chances of me winning a job that would provide a stable income was minimal, um, which is not invalid. I mean, that's a, that's, that is true. You have very low chances of winning an orchestra job. So, so I started off as a music major and I, I kind of wish that I hadn't and I had just taken all of my history and theory as electives. Um, I really, really appreciate what I learned at Harvard in terms of my music classes, but they didn't have a performance major at that point. They're, now they have a link to New England Conservatory, so you can get credit for your lessons and your playing and performing. But when I was at Harvard, all of that stuff was extracurricular. We got no credit for orchestra, no credit for lessons. So it was still really was two separate worlds. So basically halfway through college, I had finished the basic music requirements and I thought, there is no way I'm taking something like counterpoint at Harvard. It, it would have been an excellent course, but I didn't want to use up my time there taking something that I could take at conservatory. I assumed at that point I would go on and get a master's or something at conservatory. So I basically switched to to add French about halfway through. I'm really, really glad I did. Um, I really loved all the reading and, um, and I also loved all the other courses I took in the general electives. Um, they call it the core curriculum. And I, I really, really, really loved um, getting to learn about random stuff like vision and the brain or an astronomy course, or I took a course with Simon Shama, the noted art historian about Bernini. I mean, it, it was wonderful stuff. And then you went to conservatory? No, I didn't. During my senior year, two things happened. I won a Fulbright to go study in Frankfurt with Alice Giles, who was teaching at the conservatory there. I was very excited about that. But also, the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra audition came up um, during my senior year. They had auditions in the September of, would have been 94. And they ended up, I think that was their third round of trying to fill the position. The position was open for a while. They did not hire anybody from that round, but they sent out letters in that January 
inviting a few people to come back. And so I remember I took the letter to my teacher and said, should I do this? I'm really busy. And she just looked at me and said, yes, you should do that. So that's the round that I ended up winning and then was invited to play twice with the orchestra, once in April and once in May. And then I was offered the job in May of 95. So I graduated from college and had this job to, to go to. So I spent the summer at Tanglewood uh, as a fellow there going through all the orchestra rep I would need for the next year with my teacher so that I was really, really prepared for that first year here with the ASO. How long did you spend in Germany? I ended up not going. I okay. had to decline the Fulbright because I was coming here instead. That was a very difficult decision. The Fulbright people were amazing um, in how they let me just keep pushing the deadline back as I waited to hear from the ASO. So they, they held my spot as long as I asked them to. And I really appreciate that. They're very, very kind about it. And then it, it all worked out because Alice Giles came through Atlanta after I'd been here for a little while. She was the harpist I was going to study with there. And I said, now, I'm so sorry I never had the chance to come study with you. I was really looking forward to that. And she said, oh, well, why don't you come stay on my sheep farm in Australia? She had moved back to Australia by then and study with me some summer. And so I did. I spent three weeks with her and her family in a sheep farm in Yaz, Australia. And, um, and she, it was amazing working with her. She really worked um, with me on how I sit at the harp, how um, the quality of pressure you put on the strings really freed up my playing in a way that it, it just felt so much better after working with her. Uh, it was a really pivotal experience that I'm very grateful I had. Did you get to work with the sheep at all or? No, I didn't. I was there in August. So, you know, being Southern Hemisphere, when I got there, all the big, all the sheep were very, very big and fluffy. And when I left, all the sheep had little lambs next to them. So it was a great time to be there. So I, I got to see the baby lambs, um, but I didn't do any sheep work. Are there different schools of styles of playing within the art world? There are. There definitely are. So there are two main ones, the Salzedo school and the French school, but then there are also lots of variants like the Russian school of playing. So when I was a young student, those camps were very, very separate and not, not in a healthy way at all. And I think that has changed a lot. Sometimes people will still ask, oh, what technique are you? But, um, but that's becoming more rare. And I think that's a very good thing because everybody's an individual and you have to make sure you're working in the way that is best for your own body. That being said, I absolutely think there's a place for really strong foundation in technique for every single player. You just might have to tweak a few things, but I am really lucky that I got to study with several people who had worked directly with Salzedo. Um, so I grew up going to the Salzedo Summer Harp Colony in Camden, Maine with Alice Shalafu as an instructor there. And then later, I, uh, in, just in like the past decade, I've been able to work with Heidi Lee Walder again, who was, or for the first time, because she had really spent much of her career more in chamber music and solo performances, and more recently came back towards teaching. And um, she just has a wealth of knowledge. She was really Salzedo's last big protege and worked incredibly closely with him. What she took from the Salzedo technique is in some ways different from the way a lot of younger people teach the Salzedo technique. Her version of it is a much more organic way of playing. Um, the stereotype of Salzedo technique is you know, elbows up and thumbs high and very tight. And her way of playing, I believe, is closer to the way Salzedo himself would have played, not at all rigid and just very much about tone production and um, musicality. And so that's that's why, you know, that the super stereotype of the Salzedo technique is that it's rigid. The super stereotype of the French technique is that there's no structure. And 
And none of that is help, healthy or, or helpful. Um, I mean, Salzado himself came from France. He was an American citizen, but he would, grew up in the French technique of playing. So obviously he incorporated that into his style as well. Can you say a few words about the Russian technique? So that one I'm less familiar with from what I've been told is that every single note is emphasized, um, like really strong fingers and brilliant sound. That sort of also characterizes Russian orchestras to some degree. Sure. Because yeah. they do have a very different sound than, than uh, Western orchestras. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Very it interesting. Is. Have you had private students yourself? Oh, I teach a lot. Yes, I have students through the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra Talent Development Program. And then I also teach at Emory, Georgia State, and Kennesaw State. That's quite a busy schedule for you. It is busy. Um, so the, the concession I made when I had my own kids is I stopped having private students. So I have very, very, very few separate private students. I really believe in the mission of the talent development program. So it's really important for me personally to, to keep up with that. Uh, and then with the universities, the way it works with HARP is it's very rare to have a year where all three of them have active studios. You just kind of accumulate harpists and then they graduate and you can't always get the next crop in. Um, so right now I have a master's student at Georgia State, nobody at Kennesaw State and two at Emory, but um, I think the next group at Emory will have a lot more harpists. There seems to be a lot of interest, but it's kind of cyclical. You'll have a lot and then you won't have a lot. You're part of the Marion Quartet. Can you speak it's a, a bit about that? It's a quintet. Quintet, sorry, there are, yes. There are five of us. We are all uh, members of the ASO, five women from the ASO. It's me, Christina Smith, Emily Brebach, Marcy Gurno, and Jessica Udan. So we have harp, flute, viola, clarinet, and oboe English horn. So it's a nice mix of in instruments. We got together in 2018, um, basically because I had looked at the an upcoming season of for us at the orchestra and there was literally one piece composed by a woman in our main series I was a little frustrated by that so i asked and things are much better now they i think the orchestra is really making strides at being more inclusive in their programming so i asked a couple of my colleagues if they would want to form this group dedicated to playing chamber music composed by women with the mission of playing pieces that already exist and also commissioning at least one work per year. And so I'm really happy to say that we have two commissions under our belt already. We were fulfilling that mission. We have two this year um, instead of just the one. And then we all have plans. We're um, raising funds for next year's as well and have a composer identified for the following year too. So. Things are really exciting with the Marion Ensemble. We also are planning and hoping to record an uh, album with mostly works by first generation and newly immigrated American women. So just American works. Some commissions for our ensemble will have three or four at the time frame we're targeting for recording, but also we'll do some of our duets um, that I've transcribed from piano parts with the composer's blessings and um, maybe a trio or two. So it's Excellent. exciting times. Do you have concerts in the Atlanta area? We do. We have um, four performances next spring, one at Agnes Scott in February. They are actually funding the commission of an Atlanta-based composer for us. So it's, we'll be doing a premiere there. Emory in March, where we'll be premiering a work by Lynn Plowman, who's a Welsh, based in Wales, she's a British composer. And then we are also performing at uh, more of an outreach event at Trinity Mercantile in early March, and then at First Presbyterian Church of Gainesville in late April. So we have a busy spring coming up. Wow. And so what we do is that's pretty typical of what our goal is for the spring. We'll have several concerts and each spring we premiere a new program with one or two commissions on it. So we have entirely new repertoire for next spring. Do you work with any other chamber groups in the Atlanta area? 
whenever I'm asked. I have no one that I you know, that I appear on every concert. I've played with Atlanta Chamber Players last spring. I just played at in Macon with the Mercer Group on their Fabian series two weeks ago. Um, so yes, I love I love playing chamber music. Let's talk some more then about your CD. Okay, um, great. It is. Those are your transcriptions. Yes, they are. For Except for the, the contemporary women. Um, that Those are all originally for Harp, with the exception of Niloufar Nubash. And she um, gave permission for me to do the transcription, and we worked on it together. I would, I would work on it a little, send her a recording. She would say, that's great. I want a little bit more power in this part. And so I kind of tweak it and figure out what to do and send it back. And it was a really fun collaborative process. And actually, she and I are talking about um, her writing a harp solo for me in a year or two. So that would be really thrilling. I, it was just a bunch of circumstances lining up. I was, happened to be reading a, an autobiography of uh, an Iranian woman, Satira Farman Farmian, which is a really great book called Daughter of Persia. And then the same day I saw um, a woman playing the Chang, which is an ancient Persian harp. Um, there was something on, I think it was Instagram. And I thought all these things lining up, plus I email every so often with Nilfar. So I asked her if she'd ever be willing to write a piece based on ancient Persian melodies for harp. And uh, she said she was really interested in it. And there are even some women composers of the court before the time of Christianity in Iran, um, and that she would love to research them as well and then create a new work for Harp. So it's it's really fun when those things line up. The, the CD's on the Albany label? It is. Mm -hmm. Do you have a contract arrangement or something like that? No, I don't have anything um, permanent with them. That was really through Elaine Martone, who was with Telark for many, many, many years. She was the producer on many Grammy award-winning recordings of the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. So I had already planned to work with her as my producer for Quest, and she um, contacted Susan Bush at Albany to let her know about the project, and they said, yes, they would be um, happy to be the label. When did you do the recordings? So the idea kind of was percolating in early summer 2020. Um, I had been using the time away from the symphony because of COVID, you know, time to do individual projects. So I, I had done a lot of transcriptions. I was posting them like once a month on social media and calling it the evening standard, a project to even out and open up the concept of standard repertoire. And that idea came because my solo solo recital the year before had all these pieces that I really love and that speak to me and that had some of Mal Bonis works that are on the CD. And one of my harp friends afterwards said to me, well, that was really beautiful, but do you ever play the standard repertoire? And I kind of sat with that comment for a couple of days, wondering why it, why I resonated with it the way I did. And then I thought, well, that's the whole point. This should be standard repertoire. This should have been standard repertoire. And so that's why I call it the evening standard. Not like I'm out to take over the world. I just want it to be more even like there are so many programs still that have no women composers on them and there's no reason for that there's so much great music that already exists it just isn't heard isn't shared isn't played enough even you know you'll see so many recitals at conservatories of basically any instrument and there will be no women in the as composers so so that was a project that I was working on independently. And then at the beginning of summer 2020, I started thinking, gosh, I would, I would really love to record this. I, I love this music so much. And at that point, it was maybe about 30 minutes of music and happened to be Facebook friends with Elaine Martone. And 
Apparently she and I both go through the New York Times and pick out the recipes we want to try. And this was June 2020, like when all of our creative wheels were spinning. And she put a picture of a beautiful strawberry pie and said, yes, this is great, but does anybody need a good producer, like a really, really good producer? And it had caught my eye because my daughter and I had made the same pie earlier that day. And so I messaged Elaine and said, okay, I, I'm pretty sure you're kidding. I'm pretty sure I can't afford you. I have this solo project I'm really excited about. Do you have any interest? And so she wrote back, I was like, sure. Yeah, tell me more about it. And so we started talking about it. And like I said, it was about a half an hour of music at that point. And it um, kind of expanded to the full hour that it is now. And every step of the way, she'd say, it's your recording. Go ahead and do it. If you want to add it, you can add it. Even up to a month before, um, Fanny Mendelssohn's birthday is coming up this Sunday. And this time, just last year, I knew that date was coming up. I was playing through some of her music and I hadn't planned to put it on the recording, but it was just, I started playing the opening measures and literally got choked up because I felt so bad that I'd always thought Felix Mendelssohn had a talented sister and basically stopped there. Didn't really bother getting to know her voice. And it wasn't just that he had a talented sister. It's that Fanny Mendelssohn was an immensely beautiful composer. I mean, she, her melodies, her compositions are just gorgeous. Never mind whose family she was part of. And so, you know, a month before we were supposed to record at Kenesa, get on the computer to Elaine. Elaine, can I add one more? It's short. Um, so that's just an example of how it really all came together in a beautiful way um, throughout the second half of 2020. Recorded it in December at Kennesaw State University. And one thing that was only semi-intentional, it's balanced perfectly between historic and contemporary composers, which is really important to me. You know, I, I of course want to support the great people composing today, but also, especially for people like Mel Bonis, their stories are so compelling and their music is so beautiful. And just because it's been ignored for a hundred years shouldn't mean it should still be ignored. I really think that that has an active place on the concert stage as well. What have the, the responses been like to your CD? It's kind of taken my breath away a little bit because it's one thing to have a goal and to do your best to try to realize that goal. And my goal was this, with this was to present a bunch of music that I really believe in, that I really love from composers past and present. And there have been reviews that have completely understood that goal and, and said stuff like, it's a powerful reminder of what might have been. I, I mean, to, to have these women recognized is, it's wonderful. It's exactly why I did it. And I don't take that lightly at all. I mean, that is a real gift when you try to do something and people understand it. Um, so that's, I am, I just feel very, very grateful for the whole process. It was, it was great. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and congratulations. The reviews I've read have been glowing, but I didn't want to predispose your response. So that's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Wonderful. Anything else that you would particularly like to cover? I've been working on publishing transcriptions of uh, the works that I transcribed for HARP. And that's been a long and involved process. I hired a former student who's currently a doctoral student in composition to do the engraving. So putting all of my scribbles into nice music that people can read. So those are gonna be available to harvests um, later in November. Uh, and that's, that's really the next step for the project for me to make sure that it's not just stuff that I'm able to play, but stuff that everybody can add to their teaching studios and um, recital programs. And then three of the other Bonis pieces are going to be published in France um, by Etition Biodo. Uh, so that's 
And that was arranged um, with the help of Malvonis' great granddaughter. We have an email friendship at this point, and she she liked the transcriptions. I sent her the transcriptions and the recording, and she um, she has a competition she runs over there and wanted to put some of the music as a competition repertoire, which would get it out um, to even more harpists, students, and teachers. Yeah, the transcriptions, getting them published is the next part of this. I, I actually, I do have one other question. Other than the people who have taught you and been mentors, is there somebody you particularly admire who, uh, another harpist? Well, the harpists I mentioned um, would certainly fall in that category, like Heidi Lewalder um, is an amazing um, performer. I mean, she brings such intense commitment um, to her playing that I, I really love her playing. Alice Giles is a beautiful, beautiful player. Isabelle Perrin is a French harpist who is a who has a really strong partnership with the harpist composer Bernard Andres, and she premieres a lot of his works. And I really admire her, um, both for her advocacy for a great composer, um, but also her playing and her teaching. She's a really wonderfully compassionate, caring teacher. I've seen her work in master classes, um, and also Marie Pierre Langlemé. Uh, she's the harpist with the Berlin Bell, and um, she, I was reading an article about her, and she put so beautifully that something about the challenges of the harp, because it is, it has its strengths. It's a beautiful instrument. I love it. I wouldn't want to play any other. I love all the colors that you can bring from the harp, but, you know, you, there's, there's some navigating you have to do, and she, she had a quote about um, having, something like having your love of the music and what you want to communicate transcending the limitations of the instrument. And I just thought that was a, a really beautiful way of putting it. Um, Cause we want it to sound like we want a melody to sound like you're singing it. And we have to do that with our fingers. It, it, so they, they're you know, seamless transitions that might be really awkward with moving a million pedals. And I think it's so important to always keep in mind that the technique is in order to the is in service to the music. Mm -hmm. And that's something too that, you know, you asked about harpists specifically, but I will never forget the privilege of working with Robert Shaw. Uh, and that's exactly what he was always about, like controlling the minutest detail so that the music could speak in the fullest way imaginable. Um, and that balance of discipline and technique put in service to the music and what you're trying to communicate emotionally is just that perfect trying to straddle both universes and, um, and something that I really try to incorporate as much as I can. Do you listen to music much yourself? I do. What kind do. do you listen to? Well, I hear a lot of kids songs in the car with my children, but I like, I like all kinds of music. I love ballet music. I really, really love the ballet. Um, that's what I would go to far more often than the symphony. When I was a kid, my mom and I had season tickets to the Boston Ballet. So I saw them all the time. The music of Prokofiev and Tchaikovsky. I know I'm not like setting the world on fire with a statement, but I truly love that music. It's, it's beautiful. And the harp parts are fantastic. My recording is uh, on the long list for Grammy consideration. And I went through the recordings like you're supposed to, you can click on each one that's up for consideration and listen to it. And um, one of the opera recordings by Papano with Diana Damrau, Donizetti Tudor Queens. I mean, it's like it jumped out of my computer to say, oh, this is a fantastic recording. So I I've actually been driving around listening to that because it was riveting from the opening measures. I, that's a fantastic recording. But that was actually a really fun process to see all of all of the recordings that are up and just get an idea of what's going on um, across the landscape. But that was that was really really fun. And congratulations on that, by the way. That's wonderful. Thank you. That's Thanks. Wonderful. All right, I've kept you long enough. That's okay. It's enjoyable. Uh, hey, thanks a lot. All right, thank Bye -bye. you.
Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. Please join at patreon.com forward slash Atlanta Music Critic. Produced by William Ford. Recorded via Zoom. November 9, 2021. Thanks to Ms. Remy Johnson for her patience during production.